The red-browed Amazon parrot, Amazona rotocoretha, is the most endangered Amazon parrot in South America. It's one of the most endangered Amazon parrots in the world, in the genus Amazona, which comprises 26 different species from the New World, Caribbean, South America. The red-browed Amazon parrot is what I call a conflict species. It's a very iconic flagship species for Brazil's biodiversity, but it's also a conflict species. And if you look at its history and its conservation importance today, it tells a story about how the species came to be in such a desperate state and what the role of conservation is in trying to save it. At one time, the red-browed Amazon parrot was a very common species that was well distributed across the coastal Atlantic forest, which is the east coast of Brazil, central and southeast Brazil. And large flocks were found, thousands and thousands of birds, maybe as, as recently as a century ago. But you have to appreciate that the Atlantic forest of Brazil is one of the most decimated, highly impacted areas of our planet. It's also one of the most biologically diverse areas of our planet, but it's lost over 98% of its forest cover. It has suffered tremendously at the hands of man, and not just the forest, but all of the forest and habitats, including primates and birds and insects and all of the biodiversity that we now appreciate is just so vital to the life-sustaining forces of this planet. The red-browed Amazon parrot is a conflict species in this region, not only because it has lost so much of its habitat, but also because it has been the focus of trade. It's been the focus of wildlife trade. It's been consumed locally because of its incredible mimicking ability, its ability to talk, its beautiful appearance, and the fact that uh, there have been a, been, a, been a long culture of uh, keeping parrots as pets, and this uh, bird as a companion bird was a very popularized pet. So you fast forward through all of the tensions and all of the impacts that can assault uh, a tropical species. And what you see is that in addition to habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, the expansion of agriculture, the expansion of human settlements, the hunting of birds for food, the collecting of birds for the pet trade, and the export of birds for the pet trade, these take an enormous cumulative toll, not only on populations, but on the sustainability of whatever's left in the wild. And this sort of assault has been going on in Brazil for many, many, many years. In fact, so much so that as, as recently as 30 years ago, when one of the more popular treatises on endangered parrots first came out, which was called Endangered Parrots, it featured our friend right here on the cover, the red-browed parrot right on the cover. And Rosemary Lowe, who became known as a very popular uh, writer of not only avicultural books and magazines, but what I would say popularized articles, about parrots and parrot conservation, wrote in this book uh, 30 years ago that were there as many as one dozen pairs in captivity, there would be at least some spark of hope for the future of the red-browed Amazon. Instead, there is none. And that really epitomized the understanding of the species at that time, which is that the bottom had fallen out, the habitat it was decimated, these birds had never been cultured in captivity, there's just a handful scattered around and we were looking at the end of the red-browed Amazon, just as we've looked at the end of so many other conflict species, species that have been consumed for trade, or from wildlife hunting, or because they, they just simply have no more habitat in which to survive. Thirty years later, we're seeing a very different picture for this species, and what this film documents and what this story really tells is what is possible with a very limited finite resource and a number of people that are willing to do outrageous things over a very long period of time to bring back the viability, the functionality and, and really the, the true ecology of a species to enable it to thrive again. So how do you begin a recovery program for a species on the brink of extinction? In the case of the red-browed Amazon parrot, you begin one chick at a time. The first step in recovering the species was trying to figure out if and how we could even breed it in captivity. This was challenging to say the least, considering that when RSCF began the program in 1988, there were only 11 unrelated founder birds in captivity in North America. Three males and eight females, all illegally smuggled into the U.S. from Brazil in the late 70s and 80s. 
Working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other partners, we were able to consolidate this group of wildlife refugees at our breeding facility in South Florida. This was only the first step. Now these birds actually had to breed and lay fertile eggs. To start, we designed an artificial incubation protocol for red brows because breeding pairs would often lay infertile eggs or refuse to fully incubate their eggs at all. Considering how precious each egg was to the program, the decision was made to artificially incubate every egg laid and hand rear every single chick. The goal was to build a larger population as quickly as possible. Upon removing eggs from the nest, the breeding hens would then lay multiple clutches of two to three eggs during the breeding season, which typically runs April through July. Four years elapsed, and then in 1992, we celebrated the first clutch of fertile eggs and successful hatching of chicks. A very exciting and landmark event, considering that there is a high rate of infertility in the species. We then discovered that red-browed chicks grow at an amazing rate gaining an unbelievable 15 to 20 percent of their body weight every day, reaching adult weight in about 30 days. This is no mean feat because RSCF's hand rearing protocol requires feeding newly hatched chicks every hour on the hour around the clock for the first five to seven days and then continuing that hand feeding schedule with a gradual reduction over 14 weeks. After weaning, the birds are socialized in small flocks for up to five years before they even enter sexual maturity. Believe me, raising red brows is a very, very long-term endeavor. Bottom line, starting with just 11 birds in 1988, this program has steadily grown and matured. And now, 27 years later, we are up to 78 birds in our captive colony, including second and third generation breeding successes. Our experiences over the years have also enabled us to develop a husbandry and breeding protocol that can now be shared with all our partners in Brazil and elsewhere. There's no denying the captive population is healthy and growing and we are no longer worried about losing the species in captivity. This managed group is thriving and new breeding age birds enter the population every year. While infertility remains a challenge, as it often does in any species recovery program, RSCF's commitment over the past quarter century has produced birds that are not only reproducing, but are well socialized and retain much of their wildness. What we are seeing now is a species poised to make an effective comeback in captivity and in the wild. And thanks to our program partners, we can share these techniques and methods, working together to ensure a bright future for this spectacular and iconic parrot. One of the most remarkable aspects of the Red Brow program in Brazil is the dedication by Brazilian conservationists, zoologists, facilities, and the public to not only mobilize the resources to help save this bird, but to sustain it, to maintain it long enough to see that recovery begin to happen. This is something that for a long, long time we had wished for. It's something that a lot of people had anticipated, but for a number of reasons, political, economic, uh, you name it. Uh, this was just another one of those species that had seemed to fall between the cracks. And, and once it got to such a desperately low number, the red barrel population just seemed to be one of those things that was going to disappear, and it would be a footnote. And there have been plenty of those, of course. But uh, I think to a lot of people's surprise and amazement, a couple of uh, biologists, uh, Lori Clayman and Pedro Scherer Neto, took it upon themselves to actually survey, to assess and appraise the red brow parrot throughout Brazil, not just in its stronghold of the Espiritu Santo state, but throughout Brazil. And they took a two-year jaunt driving some of the worst roads in the world to see how this parrot persisted. Where was it? Was it in captivity? Were people keeping it as pets? Was it still in the wild? Were there reports of this bird? And really what they did, which is so formative to, to science and to conservation, is they, they, they enabled a snapshot of the status of this bird to be taken. And it took a two-year exhausting, brutal survey to do it. But they pulled this off, and I think for the first time in many decades, they brought to light what was happening with this iconic species, this famously rare species. And they illuminated that it's not too late. This bird is still there. And in fact, in some cases, it's doing better than we thought. 
there are areas where it's surviving better than we thought, and if we can just kind of pull these different views together, for example, wildlife trade, law enforcement, habitat protection, outreach, conservation, zoological investment, if we could just pull all these things together, I got like we could save the species. And it actually could be a management program, recovery program we could be proud of. That effort, which these two gentlemen pioneered and, and published, became the spark for recovery of the red-browed Amazon parrot in Brazil. And really the, galvanized, uh, I think, a lot of people's commitment to doing something for this bird. Not only because it was an example that, okay, it's not too late, but if we do this, if we show this can work, if we pull together and work collegially and institutionally on this, then we can demonstrate that this is a technique and a practice that will work for many other species. And, and it's that kind of replication that makes this program so powerful. 2015 has been a pivotal year for the Red Brow Recovery Program at RSCF. For the first time in the 25-year history of the captive breeding program, all eggs laid during this year's breeding season were left in the nest, allowing the parents to hatch and rear their chicks all on their own with no human intervention. This was also the most productive breeding season ever. Parent rearing is the next step in the recovery process because it demonstrates that birds that are artificially incubated and hand reared still retain the instinctive parenting skills needed to raise their young, just as they would in the wild. This latest chapter in the story of the red-browed Amazon parrot recovery program is one of the most exciting to date, but the story isn't finished. With strong captive breeding colonies established in the U.S. and in Brazil, the future appears bright for this iconic, captivating, and beautiful bird, but there is still much more to be done. So the Curitiba Zoo, with their own staff and their own funding and, and a little bit of outside support from, from a few other players, managed to build some outstanding facilities for the birds that uh, were confiscated by government and to see breeding successes in these birds in a matter of just a couple of years. And that has continued. Now the program is, is to the point, it's developed so nicely that they're able to share this managed program with other facilities. And that's the kind of contagion we want to see. We want to see other facilities committed to this, not just to putting animals on exhibit for the public to look at, but to have true management capability, be able to do the population work and the husbandry work to ensure a future for this managed population that will integrate it with the wild population in the form of sustained releases, true recovery pro approaches. And it begins with, with outreach and education. You can't save and take pride in something you never see. And whatever happens to this bird has to be something that's collectively owned and, 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 and everyone has to take collective responsibility for it. I think public institutions do a wonderful job in that regard. It's one of the reasons that we were so inspired by what Curitiba Zoo had done and wanted to produce a relationship that was a sister type relationship here in the U.S. and that's where the Lowry Park Zoo fits in. Here's an institution that is a stone's throw from us so that we can co-manage these birds that uh, we've, we've dedicated our lives to saving all these years and they can represent to a much broader audience than a scientific behind the scenes organization ever can. What's really special about the red-browed Amazon parrots being here at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo is that we're able to connect what we're doing here uh, with the, with the red-browed Amazon parrots range country. So what's happening in Brazil is really important to us. The modern zoo is looking at more than being an exhibition of individual animals. We're looking at extraordinary animals that we can keep in family groups where we can encourage their natural behaviors. We got them in in the first couple of days. They were nervous. Um, you could tell they were very reserved. They didn't really come up to you. But then slowly, very slowly, I think the next week they started becoming a little bit more active. They would come up to you and they would start eating and we saw them cracking their nuts, which Paul told us was a really good sign. Um, and then they started singing. And I think when they started talking and singing, that was our big sigh of relief, I think. What this program means, how it works, what it takes to run it, what it means to the species, what it means to the larger biological diversity, and what it means to the people in Brazil. Here they have friends. 
And the number of visitors that the Lowry Park Zoo and the Curitiba Zoo have together is an impressive slice of, of the population. And it's not just local people, it's international people, it's guests and visitors from all over. And, and this becomes the real core mission of a public zoological facility not only to demonstrate competency and excellence in animal care, but to make sure that that animal care translates into something tangible and real for the species, that there is a benefit, not just to the animals in captivity, but to their counterparts in the wild.